Good morning. <clears throat> As uh, Mike McCrary said, there are some ways that this uh, Sunday is very different than others. <clears throat> Our uh, typical preaching pastor is not here, and many of the people who are usually up here on the uh, stage during worship are also not here. But in other ways, it's very, very typical uh, because there are people here who love God and want to honor Him uh, this morning. And so <clears throat> that, I trust, will be something that you find, whether this is your hundredth time or first time uh, attending. Please go ahead and open your Bibles to the book of Second Peter. The book of Second Peter. <clears throat> This week, um, this week I had the opportunity to um, teach my daughter how to ride a bike, <clears throat> and I use that word teach loosely because <clears throat> um, really all I did was take the training wheels off and stand at the bottom of the driveway and say, try and run me over. <clears throat> <clears throat> And uh, <clears throat> I, uh, occasionally she'd ask for some pointers, you know, how, what's the trick to keeping a good balance or, um, <clears throat> you know, how do I get on and off the bike without falling over? And I would add some additional <clears throat> insight and encouragement along those lines, but for the most part, I just tried to get out of the way. And uh, such is the task of the preacher. Uh, <clears throat> there are many ways in which I have labored long and <clears throat> over the, the text this morning, but in many other ways, my intention is to just get out of the way as we <clears throat> study the word this morning. Let me pray. God, thank you for your word. Thank you that it is sufficient, that it is wholly true, that it is inerrant, that it is all that we need for life and godliness. God, help us to understand it this morning. May this, may this sermon be honoring and pleasing to you. Father, help me to be faithful to the text, to say the things that you have already said. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Famous last words. Hey, watch this. <clears throat> I wonder what would happen if... What's the worst that could happen? Or, hey, Matthew Spivey, I think I'm going to preach through the entire letter of 2 Peter. <clears throat> sometimes last words have a tragic irony to them, but sometimes there's a little more weight. <clears throat> when we think of uh, death, people often pass suddenly. Even if we can kind of see it coming, it's, it always tends to catch us by surprise. And when that happens, we think about the last words they said and they carry more, more weight, more substance, for better or for worse. But the most weighty of words are not those spoken by somebody who is taken by surprise, but rather those who have given their life for what they believe. See, Peter was not in a position where old age had caught up to him or some disease had taken hold of his body, but rather during the persecution of Emperor Nero in Rome, Peter found himself in a position where he was going to have to die for his faith. And so, Second Peter is, for us, a farewell address. And we would do well to pay attention to it. For Second Peter, verses 13 and 14, tell us this. It says, I think it right, as long as I am in this body, to stir you up by way of reminder, since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me, and I'll make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things. Second Peter is a short letter, and <clears throat> it only takes about eight minutes to read through. So I will read it to you now. Follow along with me. Simeon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, 
by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election, for if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Therefore, I intend always to remind you of these qualities, though you know them and are established in the truth that you have. I think it right, as long as I am in this body, to stir you up by way of reminder, since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me. And I will make every effort, so that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things." For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from the God, from God the Father, and the voice was born to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain, and we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention, as to a lamp shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment... If he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness, with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly, if by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly, and if he rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, for as that righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment, and especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority. Bold and willful, they do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones, whereas angels, though greater in might and power, do not pronounce a blasphemous judgment against them before the Lord. But these, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant, will also be destroyed in their destruction. Suffering wrong is the wage for their wrongdoing. They count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions while they feast with you. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice and steady souls. They have hearts trained in greed. Accursed children, forsaking the right way, they have gone astray. They have followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved gain from wrongdoing, but was rebuked for his own transgression. A speechless donkey spoke with human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. These are waterless springs and mists driven by a storm. For them, the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved. For speaking loud boasts of folly, they entice by sensual passions of the flesh those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. For whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. For if, after they have escaped the defilements of the world, through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the last state has become far worse than the first. For it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandments delivered to them. What the true proverb says has happened to them. 
The dog returns to its own vomit, and the sow, after washing herself, returns to wallow in the mire. This is now the second letter that I am writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles, knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlook this fact, that the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God, and that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you are awaiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. Now there are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and and to the day of eternity. Amen. One bonus <clears throat> application that I have found convicting throughout my life is if you feel like Bible study is too hard or it takes too long, read a small book of the Bible and time it, and you will find that it's not nearly as long as you thought it was. Reading Second Peter takes about eight minutes, and there are days where we do not have eight minutes free to spend. And God knows those days. But there are more days than not, I would guess, where you have eight minutes to spend reading the word. <clears throat> it is clear from this letter of Second Peter that Peter wants his readers to know something. The word knowledge shows up over and over and over again. In verse 2, he says, May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. In verse 3, he says, Through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. In verse 5, he adds uh, to your faith virtue and virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control. Verse 8, he says, This will keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 16, he says, For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you. In verse 20, he says, Knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from one's own interpretation. In chapter 2, verse 20, he says that if after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome. The last state has become worse than the first. 21 says, For it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. In chapter 3, verse 3, he says, Knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with their scoffing. And in the final verse of the letter, chapter 3, verse 18, he says, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Peter clearly wants us to know something, but what is this knowledge? What is it that he wants us to know? In a word, 
it's the gospel. The gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ. It is the good news that the Bible teaches us from cover to cover. This is what he wants us to know. But he doesn't want them only to know it. He wants them to remember it. Again, remember his putting off of the body, his execution is at hand. Chapter 1, verse 12 says, Therefore I intend always to remind you of these qualities, though you know them and are established in the truth that you have. I think it right as long as I am in this body to stir you up by way of reminder. Right? He says again in chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, This is now the second letter I'm writing to you, beloved. In both of them I'm stirring you up, stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets. Peter wants them to know the gospel. He wants them to remember it when he's gone. And so he makes every effort to explain it to them from every angle. Chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, he tells them what the gospel is. Verses 5 through 11, he says what the gospel does. Then in verses 12 through 21, he talks about the veracity or the truthfulness of the gospel. Chapter 2 is dedicated to what the gospel is not. He contrasts it with those who exploit people. They take hold of the word of truth and they see that they can get gain from it. They are trained in greed. They are slaves to their own sensuality and they lead others astray who are barely escaping from the world. They see a glimmer of hope, a glimmer of truth, and they follow it to their doom and their death. And then chapter 3, Peter talks about what the gospel will do in the future, that we are waiting for a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. For our purposes this morning, we will focus on just the first two, what the gospel is and what the gospel does. Look then in 2 Peter at the first verse of the first chapter. Simeon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. Simeon or Simon, Peter. Simeon or Simon is his given birth name. Peter is the nickname that Jesus gave him. He said, you are Peter, you are the rock, and upon this rock I will build my church. Jim taught us two weeks ago about, <coughs> about Peter his naming, and how he was the rock of stumbling and offense sometimes, not the rock. That's the cornerstone. That's Christ. Hang on. So, he taught us about how he was a stumbling block, and Christ had to tell him, get behind me, Satan. He talked about how he denied Christ three times, but how he restored him. Matthew taught us last week from 1 Peter how this restored apostle had been used of God to spread the word to the nations. And now here we are with his final letter as he will be faithful finally unto death. <clears throat> Verse 1, again, he says, He is a servant or a slave and an apostle of Jesus Christ. To those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. To those who have obtained what? A faith. What kind of equal standing? With whom? The apostles. How is this possible? How can these people have a faith that is of equal standing of the apostles? A man who has been trained by Christ, who has walked with him, and now is ready to die for him. How do these people have a faith of the same quality, of the same standing with the apostles? Simple. Because it's based on the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. If you're here today and you feel really good about yourself, or if you're here today and you feel really bad about yourself, we all have the same hope of heaven, and that's Christ. We have the same standing. It's not through our works, but because of His. And because of His righteousness, we have access to the Father. We have the opportunity to have a faith of equal standing, an equal standing with the apostles even. Verse 2, may grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord. Excuse me, and of Jesus our Lord. Grace and peace multiplied in knowledge. Now remember, this knowledge cannot save you by itself. For if it could, he would not have said in chapter 2, right? Verse 
20, for if after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome the last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would be better for them to never have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. So this knowledge can save, but it also can condemn. What is the difference? The difference we saw in verse 1. It is faith. It is faith. And this faith is a gift of God. It is not by works. It's not of ourselves. So that no one can boast. We noted earlier, right, that this knowledge that can save is the gospel. It is the good news of Jesus Christ. But we need to unpack that a little bit further. What exactly is it? Well, perhaps... It's Matthew chapter 16. Perhaps it's Matthew 16, which begins in verse 13. <clears throat> nope, hang on. I am in Matthew. I am in 16. Yes, no, we're there. Great. It is Matthew 16. <clears throat> verse 13, right? <clears throat> Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Like a good Sunday school answer. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. The key question in that is, but who do you say that I am. Even the demons knew, right, as James says, that God is one, that Jesus was God in the flesh, and they shuddered, but they don't respond in faith. They don't respond with repentance. Or perhaps he was thinking of Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 at Pentecost, you can turn there. Acts chapter 2, beginning in, we'll start in verse 22. Maybe Peter's thinking about this when he talks about knowledge. Acts 2:22 Men of Israel hear the words hear these words Jesus of Nazareth a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst as you yourselves know this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men God raised him up loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it for David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand and I, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we all are witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand, until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. And what was their response? In verse 37, Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent, repent, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
Perhaps he was thinking of that message where he testified to the birth, the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus, how he is in the line of David, how God raised him back to life and seated him on the throne in the heavens. You see how they respond with a change of mind, repentance, that they have a change in their mind, in their thinking, that this knowledge is presented to them and it causes an action inside of them. Or perhaps Peter was thinking of chapter, chapter 10 of Acts when he first shared the gospel with the Gentiles. Chapter 10, verse 34. Peter opens his mouth and says, Truly, I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. As for the word that he sent to Israel preaching good news, that's the gospel of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. And they put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and made him to appear not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. So when Peter is talking about this knowledge, this knowledge that must be applied, believed, received by faith and followed by repentance, a change of mind where we understand that we are sinners in need of a Savior. It could be that he's thinking of these things. Or maybe he's thinking of the whole gospel from cover to cover. You see, in the beginning, God created a world in order to put his his glory on display. Every aspect of his character is visible through his creation. Romans 1 tells us that his divine attributes, namely his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived since the beginning of the world. So whether you're looking at a mountain, an ocean, or a butterfly, you can see the glory of God in those things. And you can know that he is all-powerful and that he is God because no one else can make such things. But people were created in the image of God because there's more to know about who God is than that he's all-powerful and he is God. And through people being created in his image, he has the ability in and through us to demonstrate more and more of who he is. You learn about his mercy and his patience and his kindness and his justice and his wrath. And on and on and on it goes in all of history. It wasn't intended to be, well, no, it was intended to be that way. But people were created in the beginning in the image of God and we rebelled. We were made like God, but we wanted to be God. That was the temptation. That he said, when you eat the fruit of the tree, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. But they were already like God, created in his image. And so they believed the lie. They plunged the world into sin and death and darkness. And We've been spreading our own glory ever since. But God wrote himself into the story so that Jesus... God in the flesh is the image of the invisible God and perfectly demonstrates all of who God is because he is in very nature God. And he took the wrath, bore the punishment for those who would believe in him. The gospel is the story of restoration because when that happens, the broken piece inside of you, your heart of stone is replaced with a heart of flesh. You're made alive and you receive forgiveness of of your sins and the Holy Spirit who then enables you to live the way that you were created to live. To demonstrate through your life, through your words, your thoughts, and your actions, who God is in and through what you do. So it's unclear exactly which part of this, or possibly all of it, Peter has in mind when he says, may grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, But it's clear that he's talking about the restoration that is found in the gospel. Read with me 2 Peter 1, verses 3 and 4. He says, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge 
of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. You see, the gospel restores. We see God's divine power at work. It reminds us perhaps of what Paul wrote in Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, when he said, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. This grants us life and godliness. Godliness is not some sort of divinization where we become God, but rather it's a piety, it's a life that God is pleased with. This comes, again, through that knowledge, the knowledge of God, the knowledge of the gospel. And we are called to his glory and excellence. We are called to put his glory, his greatness, his excellence has to do with virtue, his moral excellence on display through the way that we live. It promises us a future, a future hope, and through it we have, again, become partakers of the divine nature, not some sort of Buddhist understanding where we're all one and we all partake of God, but in the sense that his nature, his character, his goodness, his virtues, then because we have the Holy Spirit who dwells inside of us is what we desire. It's what we plan for. It's what, it is our aim. It is our goal. It is what we live out. <clears throat> and we can see this because it's contrasted with the second part of that verse having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desires. Friends, this is what the gospel is. Peter wants you to know it. He wants you to believe it. He wants you to remember it. But secondly, we have to look at what the gospel does. This is in verses 5 through 11. What the gospel does. Verse 5, he begins, For this very reason... Because of the gospel, because of the things you claim to believe, because of what God has done, for this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. Supplement your faith? <clears throat> what is he saying here? That having begun by faith... We are now to finish by works? No, not at all. Is he saying that faith plus works is heaven, equals heaven? No. That faith alone is not enough? No. What, what is it that he's saying? Well, first, we have to be careful when we find lists in the scriptures. I am a man of lists. Uh, I have a checklist mentality. If I have tasks to accomplish, I make a list and then I check them off and I cross them out. If I am going to the grocery store and my wife asks me to pick up some things, I bring a list. My list looks like this. She can ask me to get anywhere between one and 10 things because this is my list. And I walk around the grocery store like this and then I look at the cart and I look at my hand. And if I do not have five things in the cart, I know I'm missing one. And then I stand there in whatever aisle I find myself until I remember what that thing was <laughs> and then I go find it or I make it up, then I at least have five things. No. <clears throat> this is not what happens in the scriptures. It's not a checklist of moral things that we have to do because faith isn't enough. Faith is not something that begins our Christian walk and yet works finishes it. Faith is all of it. And so it might be better put the way the New American Standard translates it, supply in your faith. In and through your faith, accomplish these actions. The other thing to know about this list is it's not some sort of Russian nesting doll where we've unpacked one and we found another and we unpack one and we find another and we unpack one and we find another. Otherwise, all the lists in Scripture would be the same. You think of perhaps the fruit of the Spirit, right? That there's love, joy, pace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, right? But they're just lists of virtues, However, that being said, he does begin it with faith and he does end it with love. But that being said, because he chose to write these ones down, let's take a look and see what sort of things is your faith supposed to produce? What does the gospel do? Well, the first one, supply in your faith virtue. 
And this is moral excellence. This is the exact same word that we saw up in verse 3, where he has called us to his own glory and excellence. That's the same word, a moral excellence, a virtue. We are to have this same virtue demonstrated in our own lives. And to the virtue, then we add knowledge. This knowledge is the gospel that we've just talked about extensively, but it's also the wise moral application of the scriptures to your life. There's always more to know about who God is, and you are to always be studying and working and learning and adding those things and submitting your life to the scriptures as you learn more and more. To knowledge, self-control. Self-control, we think of, again, the fruit of the Spirit that I just quoted for you from Galatians 5. Self-control, steadfastness. Steadfastness. We think about perhaps James, where he says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you face trials of various kinds, knowing that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness or endurance. This is a character trait that must mark true saving faith of the believer. And with stead, to steadfastness, godliness. Godliness, we again think of not being God, but it is a piety. It is a right worship. It is living a life that is approved by God. And with godliness, we supply brotherly affection. This is because we are brothers and sisters. In a church, if we truly believe and are saved, then the people here sitting beside you are your brothers and sisters in Christ. This is your family, and you ought to treat them as the family of God. <clears throat> and then even beyond that, beyond brotherly affection, he ends with love. This is not an emotion. This is not some sort of affection, but it is a choice and it is an action. It is something that we choose to do. We choose to love. And we love because God first loved us, and we love others because God has indeed loved us. These are the things that you should look for in your life if you claim to have a saving faith. Verse 8, it says the reason. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you claim to have this saving knowledge of who God is, if you claim to understand the gospel, then you will make sure that these qualities are yours and are increasing. They're not a once-for-all injection of things, but a training and a working. Your faith works out these things. And so, it will keep you from being ineffective. That word means idle or lazy. It will keep you from being idle and lazy in your faith or unfruitful. You think of perhaps the parable of the fig tree that you go out and find no figs. The tree is not producing fruit. But if you have these character qualities, then they will keep you from being idle, lazy, ineffective, unfruitful, unproductive in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities, verse 9, is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. This is not necessarily saying that if you lack these qualities, that you are definitely, for sure, an unbeliever. But it does mean that if you claim to believe certain things about who God is, and you don't live in light of that, there is no confidence that you can place in that kind of faith. James calls that faith dead. A faith without works is dead. He says, if you lack these qualities and you say you're a believer, then you are so nearsighted that you are blind because you have forgotten what you claim to believe, that God has cleansed you from your former sins that you are still walking in. Verse 10, he says, Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election, for if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. Be all the more diligent. Be eager with zeal. Pursue these things because it confirms the calling and election that you have. 
For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. It does not mean you will never sin. It does not mean that you will never mess up. Because it's juxtaposed to verse 11. For in this way there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He means that if you have a saving faith that lives out the realities of what you claim to believe, then you will make it to the end. You will make it to the end. You think of perhaps Jude, which says, Jude 24, which says, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, and now and forever. Amen. The reason you make it to the end is because Christ has a hold of you. If you have received a saving faith as a gift from God, then that faith works because the Holy Spirit dwells inside of you and it produces these things, these qualities, because you were created in order to put the greatness of God on display. And if you don't live in light of that, there's no confidence you can place in that kind of faith. But if you do, then you can be confident not in your own abilities or in your works or in the substance of in the substance of your own strength, but rather placing all of your confidence in the one who gifted the faith, that he will finish the work that he has begun in you, and he will carry it to completion. The danger we have is, you think of Matthew chapter 7, where Jesus says, on that day, the last day before the judgment, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did I not do these great things in your name? And I will say, depart from me, I never knew you, you workers of lawlessness. Friends, and so my encouragement to you from 2 Peter this morning is to test yourself to check to check your faith, to examine it, to see if it's true. There are three three ways, three ways that you can test your faith. The first is the accuracy of your knowledge. Are the things that you believe about who God is and what he's doing true to the scriptures? Do you have the right knowledge? Is it accurate? The second way you test it is through the actions of your faith. Do you live in light of the things that you claim to believe? Or, if we look at the way you live, is it more consistent with the things that you claim to hate? The accuracy of your knowledge, the actions of your faith, and lastly, the attitude you have in trials. You see, the greatest test is when your faith is tested in trials, what is your attitude? To where do you turn? Where do you run? Where do you go? Do you rest in the knowledge of God who has promised, who has promised to carry you into the entrance of the eternal kingdom? Do you hope in those things? Or is your hope shaken because it's in this world? It's in this life. It's in the things that you want. It's the things you can't have. You see, Peter exhorts his readers because he knows the end is near. I'll remind you, this is Peter who fell away. Peter who denied Christ three times. But now God has restored him and kept him faithful to the end. He's run his race. The end is near. And his final exhortation in verse 18 of chapter 3, the final line of this letter is but grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and to him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity Amen let's pray God we are thankful we are thankful for you we are thankful for the opportunity to be in your church with your people. God, if there is anyone here who does not have an accurate knowledge of who you are, Lord, I ask that you would reveal that to them through your word, by the power of your spirit, that you would produce in them actions that are consistent with your character and your nature. Father, and those, there are those here who are in the midst of trials, and I ask that you would encourage them Father, may the trials reveal either the genuineness of their faith and help them endure to the end, or may it reveal 
that their faith was placed in something other than you. God, I ask that you would grant them faith leading to repentance, that you might receive all the honor and all the glory in all that we say and do. In Jesus' name, amen.